Hey, my name's Matt Kennedy, and this is the Steadfast Podcast. This podcast exists to use Bible study and theological teaching to encourage you to be steadfast in your faith. Thank you for taking time out of your day to check out the Steadfast Podcast. I hope today's episode is an encouragement to you. We have now come to the final chapter of the Gospel according to Luke. That is Luke chapter 24. We've seen that Christ was crucified and all the things that meant, and that he was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, just like the scriptures had foretold. The Sabbath, which was Saturday, came, and don't you know all the followers of Jesus were so shaken from what they've seen and what they've experienced? It was a lot on them. Their friend that they had followed was in the tomb, guarded by soldiers. They had left everything they had ever known to follow this Jesus, who had now been betrayed. He'd been arrested. He'd been beaten and publicly crucified. He was dead and buried. So, now what? The end of chapter 23 told us the women who had followed Jesus saw where he was buried. They left the tomb to go prepare spices, but of course they could not do that on the Sabbath. They rested as the law prescribed. Now, Sunday is here. And that is where we will pick up with Luke chapter 24, verse 1 and following. Quote, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale. And they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home, marveling at what had happened. So the women returned to the tomb with the spices they had prepared, and they had come to honor their Lord Jesus. But what they found shocked them. The stone was rolled away, the body was gone, and what's more, there were two men with dazzling clothes. They say, Jesus isn't here. They said, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not dead. He is alive. Jesus actually rose from the dead, and the disciples were shocked. What we find out later in the story, and specifically in the book of Acts, what happens is that this event took this group of people who went from hiding behind a locked door to some of the most courageous people in the history of mankind. They were willing to go all in and risk life and limb, and all the things for the sake of Christ, for they knew He is who He says He is. They were suddenly a group of people who did not fear death. What could you do to them? They went far and wide telling people about Jesus, and they suffered so much. The resurrection of Jesus proved that Jesus is the Son of God. He proved death is not the end. He proved that we do have an eternal hope. Since we do have this hope, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, quote, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. End quote. Jesus truthfully and really and actually rising from the dead changes everything. Through him, we can be steadfast, we can be immovable, always going after God's work because we know it will always mean something. Jesus gives eternity and the ultimate purpose that comes from eternity. We're not just a random set of molecules floating through the vast void of space, meaningless, purposeless, soon to be forgotten. Oh no, we are created by a creator who knows us, who loves us, who has gifted us purpose and eternity. Our lives bear the mark of God's plans and God's purposes. To be brought into a kingdom with no end, to experience life to the fullest, that is one in heaven without sin, knowing the fullest sense of what it means to be an image bearer of God. We were created for a kingdom. We were created for a family. We were created for a God. And therefore, nothing is in vain. Not the highs, not the lows, not anywhere in between is in vain because Jesus rose from the dead. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say our faith hinges on these verses. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then there is no Christianity. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 16 through 19, quote, 
For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. End quote. Basically, he is telling us if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then our faith is pointless. Those who we believe have died and gone to heaven didn't. And honestly, we are the most unfortunate people in the world dedicated to a lie. But then, in verse 20, Paul plainly says, quote, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. End quote. We just read the passage describing this fact that Christ has been raised from the dead, and that all things have been changed because of that incredible truth. Today's episode is going to be a little bit different. I want to give you a simple case for why we should historically believe in a literal resurrection. Why everyone should believe in a literal, physical, historic resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's a New Testament scholar named Gary Habermas. He has collected over 1,400 scholarly works on the resurrection. Now let me clarify, when I'm saying scholarly work... I am saying these are real academic writings done by professors and researchers with the educational credentials required to be considered an expert. Most of these, if not all of them, are PhDs. These are not the writings you're going to see on Facebook. And these are works that he is drawing from that are not just things that he Googled or looked up on the internet. Believe it or not, 99.999% of the internet is not what we should consider a good source of information. He has gathered works and gathered information from the most liberal of scholars, the most conservative of scholars, and everyone in between. In all of his research, Dr. Gary Habernas has found that there are 12 statements that virtually all of these New Testament scholars agree on, no matter how liberal or conservative they are, they agree these 12 statements are historically accurate. Number one. Jesus died by Roman crucifixion. Number two, Jesus was buried, most likely in a private tomb. Number three, the disciples were discouraged and had lost hope. Number four, the tomb of Jesus was soon after found to be empty. Number five, the disciples believed Jesus rose from the grave. Number six, due to that belief, the disciples were radically changed. Number seven, the disciples preached Jesus rose from the dead early on. Number eight, The disciples preached Jesus' resurrection in the city of Jerusalem. Number nine, the disciples' message centered on Jesus' resurrection. Number ten, the disciples primarily gathered on Sunday, the day they said Jesus rose from the grave. Number eleven, James, the half-brother of Jesus, did not believe Jesus was the Son of God until James believed he saw the risen Jesus. Statement number twelve, Saul believed he saw the risen Jesus and experienced radical life change. So those are the 12 statements. Now remember, of all of his research and over 1,400 works citing even liberal scholars and conservative scholars and everything in between, these are 12 statements that all of them generally agree with. For some of you, this may sound surprising that so many scholars would have so many things that they would point to as a, a point in the life of Jesus or the effect of the life of Jesus. And what I would like to tell you is that even though this may not be what you hear everywhere, it is a true statement. We have more historical records of the life of Jesus than virtually any figure in the ancient world. Julius Caesar is the only one that can compare, who was at one point the most famous and powerful person in the world. Julius Caesar and Jesus are by far the most verified people in the ancient world as far as like historical documents to mark their existence. So we have all of these data points. We have all of these statements here because Jesus is well verified in history. Each of the statements represents a data point. Now for the historian, the goal is to figure out what event or set of events could best explain all 12 data points. There are a few theories put forth by secular scholars to try to explain all 12 statements, all 12 data points in a very secular, naturalistic way. We'll go through each theory, and I think you're going to see they just don't work. The first theory put forth by some secular scholars is called the hallucination theory. The hallucination theory. This theory postulates that everybody hallucinated seeing the risen Jesus, that he was merely a figment of their imagination. Well, 1 Corinthians 15 contains some of the oldest words in the New Testament. They date back to just a few years after the death of Christ, and they were repeated often in the early church. Now, I'm not saying the whole letter of 1 Corinthians. I'm saying this particular part that Paul is saying. He's quoting something that would have been quoted by other people. 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 3. 
For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then He appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, He appeared also to me, end quote. So according to the hallucination theory, Peter, the rest of the disciples, James, the half-brother of Jesus, Saul, who became Paul, all just hallucinated. And then on one occasion, over 500 brothers hallucinated the exact same thing at the exact same time. Do you know how strong Saul Paul's hallucination would have had to been to get him to go from being a persecutor of the church? to a leader of the church? Or what about James? This is the half-brother of Jesus. He thought Jesus was crazy, but then he became a leader in the early church because he believed he saw Jesus after his death. In this, Paul is telling people, go and ask them what they saw. They'll tell you they are witnesses. Besides the fact, this is not how hallucinations work. Sure, someone could have hallucinated, but not that many people in regards to the exact same thing. This theory is what we call anti-science, leading us to number two. The second theory they put forth is the wrong tomb theory. I know this is going to be really complicated based on the name, but it says the disciples went to the wrong tomb. And since they went to the wrong tomb, a tomb that Jesus wasn't actually buried at, they found it empty, they thought Jesus rose from the dead, and they carried on this movement called Christianity. But look at Luke 23, verse 55, quote, The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid, end quote. So the women knew. Several women knew. We know Mary Magdalene knew, Joanna knew, Mary the mother of Jesus, and other women who had traveled with them knew where Jesus was buried. This was a huge event in their life. They didn't all mess this up. Besides, if all the confusion really boiled down to them going to the wrong tomb, then Christianity would have never started. It would have been squashed before the ball ever got rolling. When the disciples started preaching Christ had risen from the dead, how easy would it have been for the Jewish leaders or the Roman leaders to be like, hey, here's his body. You just went to the wrong tomb, guys. The first Christians would have looked insane. Actually, they probably would have just looked dumb. The movement would have been squashed, and this whole story would not have even been a footnote on a Roman history textbook. We would never have heard the name of Jesus or Peter or James or John or Paul or any of these people because it would have been a non-event. Only the most educated of Roman or Jewish scholars would have even heard of their names. This theory also failed to explain why so many people thought they saw the risen Jesus. Apparently, not only did they get the wrong tomb, but they must have all hallucinated as well. This theory falls woefully short, as did the first one. Let's get to theory number three. Theory number three is called the swoon theory. This theory says that Jesus never died, but that he swooned or fainted on the cross giving the appearance of his death. They say that he appeared to his disciples, convincing them he had risen from the dead. Now, this one might actually be the most insane of them all. Because listen to me, friends. To be clear, they are saying he was beaten. He was scourged, which means they would have like rock and bone on the end of the whip. And when that would hit into his back, it was meaning to stick into his back, pulling some of his back out as they brought it back. He was severely beaten and bloodied. He would have been unrecognizable even as he was carrying the cross up that hill. He was then nailed to the cross, left up there for like six hours, had a spear run up his side towards his heart. He was then removed from the cross, wrapped up in linens, placed in a tomb, had this giant stone at the mouth of the tomb, which had been sealed and had guards outside. Yet what he was able to do, unwrap himself, to get up, to push the giant stone away, to sneak past the Roman guards, and then appear to the people in a way that made it look like he was okay and wasn't actually in excruciating pain. Okay, sure, whatever. First up, I'm going to say the Romans were really good at killing people. I mean, they were really good at killing people. There was once a rebellion in their empire, and ancient historians said that they crucified so many people there was a shortage of wood. Now, that's definitely a hyperbole, an exaggeration, but it gets the point across, doesn't it? They knew what they were doing. Crucifying people to the point of death was routine for them. 
They killed a lot of people in a brutal, brutal way. Beyond that, I'm just going to quote an article written by three doctors in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Oh, and before I do, don't forget that John recorded that the Roman spear went up towards Jesus' heart and water came out. Okay? Now, the three doctors wrote, quote, Clearly, the weight of historical and medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead before the wound to his side was inflicted and supports the traditional view that the spear thrust between his right rib probably perforated not only the right lung but also the pericardium and heart and thereby ensured his death. Accordingly, interpretations based on the assumption that Jesus did not die on the cross appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge, end quote. Let me just repeat that last sentence. Interpretations based on the assumption that Jesus did not die on the cross appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge. Listen, since I'm going to guess most of you did not go to medical school, I did not either, but I did look it up, and the pericardium is a thin tissue around the heart. Pretty sure, according to modern medical knowledge, Jesus was dead. There is no way he was alive. And it's almost like the Lord anticipated this argument when he inspired John to give us the detail about the water coming out. Even though you know John had no idea what the fluid really was or what the fluid really meant. Jesus was dead. So the swoon theory defies modern medical knowledge. Now, one last bogus theory for you put forth by secular scholars. Number four, the stolen body theory. This theory says the disciples stole the body of Jesus. They hid it somewhere so that they could tell people Jesus rose from the dead. They believed the disciples were able to get past the Roman guards to remove the stone, to steal the body, to hide the body, and then carry on this movement. This is what the Jewish leaders told the guards to tell people in Matthew 28, verses 12 through 14. Quote, and when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people, the disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. End quote. So what this comes down to is the belief that the disciples weren't deceived. Actually, they were the deceivers. They were the liars. They were con artists. They made this whole thing up. Now, why do you think someone would do that? Maybe for fame, for fortune, for power, for influence, for notoriety, for something, right? Surely if they were con men, they would get something out of it. When we talk about conspiracy theories today, and this would be the ultimate conspiracy theory, we talk about, hey, where does the money go? Follow the money. Who's getting rich? But history tells us a different story. Actually, these men lived hard lives. They earned more infamy in their day than actual fame, more poverty than fortune, and most of them were martyred, killed for preaching the gospel. Listen to this. Matthew was murdered by the sword. Thomas was killed with a spear. James was thrown off the temple, survived, so they decided to club him to death. Bartholomew was thought to have been whipped to death. Andrew and Peter were crucified. There are some accounts that say Peter was crucified upside down after witnessing his own wife being crucified. Everyone but John was killed, and he was exiled to the island of Patmos. All of these guys, they died out of being faithful to Jesus. If fame or fortune was their goal, don't you think that before their execution, that would have been a great time to confess? To say, no, 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 hold on. This has gone too far. This has gone too crazy. We made it all up. I'll show you where the body is. And yet, not one of them did that. Now, why did none of them say, no, 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 we we're kidding. We we're made it up. It was a bad decision. It was a bad plan. We should not have lied. They couldn't say that because... They didn't steal the body. The bottom line here is you might, <clears throat> you might die for a lie that you think is true. Let me say that again. You might die for a lie that you think is true. But who would die for a lie that they know to be a lie? Who would die for a lie that they know to be a lie? If the resurrection of Jesus was made up, then it is this group of men that made it up. Why would they all die in brutal and painful ways, in poverty, for something they know isn't true? They wouldn't. This goes against every ounce of human nature. So, what explains all 12 data points? Well, the hallucination theory cannot explain them. The wrong tomb theory certainly falls short. The swoon theory defies all medical knowledge. And the stolen body theory is just simply ridiculous. The only explanation that explains all 12 statements is that Jesus really did rise from the dead. 
1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, quote, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain, end quote. So with our 12 statements, Jesus did die by Roman crucifixion, and he was buried in a private tomb, one owned by Joseph of Arimathea. The disciples were discouraged. They had lost all their hope, and they found on that Sunday that the tomb of Jesus was empty. They believed Jesus rose from the dead. They knew that it was true. They experienced the resurrected Jesus, and because of that, they were radically changed and went from cowards to being courageous men and women of God. They preached Jesus rose from the dead early on because they could not contain it. They saw Jesus after his death. They saw him resurrected from the dead, and they wanted to preach that. So they preached it in Jerusalem. Their entire message centered on Jesus rising from the dead because he really did rise from the dead. They gathered on Sunday because that is the day. They found the empty tomb, and their world was changed. So they were going to forever mark Sunday as the Lord's day, the day he rose from the grave. James, the half-brother of Jesus, saw the resurrected Jesus, and he went from thinking his half-brother was crazy to his half-brother as the Son of God. Saul, on the road to Damascus, he experienced the risen Jesus, and he went from persecutor of the church to leader of the church. He would suffer more than virtually anyone in history because he experienced the resurrected Jesus. There is only one theory, there is only one statement that accounts for all of these twelve. It is that Jesus really did rise from the dead, and that changes everything. Thanks for listening to the Steadfast Podcast. I want to remind you that in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, Paul wrote this, quote, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that that in the Lord your labor is not in vain, end quote. So in light of biblical truth, let us be steadfast, immovable. Let us remember that through Jesus, not one labor is in vain, not one trial is in vain, not one effort in all of our lives is in vain. Because he gives purpose, and that purpose rings through eternity. That's all I've got for you today. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget, if you've got questions you would like answered, you can email me at matt at steadfastpodcast.com.